Good evening. Thank you for coming uh, to the reading by Pam Houston this evening. Uh, we owe all thanks to uh, Jill Talbot for doing much of the setup, much of the work, and we owe great thanks to uh, Pam Houston for coming and then getting forward to looking forward to getting out of here tomorrow, which could be could be a bit of a test. Uh, I'm Peter Bailey of the English Department. Um, still introducing, not introducing the writer tonight, but introducing the introducer of the writer and reminding you that a mere two weeks from tonight, I know it doesn't seem like that because you think, oh, there's this great vacation in the middle. Two weeks from tonight, uh, Timothy Donnelly, a wonderful poet, will be reading here at 8 p.m. And then uh, April 4th, uh, David Shields, author of How Literature Saved My Life, um, uh, Reality Hunger, uh, Dead Languages, a lot of very fine books David will be reading on April 4th. And then on the 25th of April, uh, Stephanie Elizondo Griest, our uh, visiting uh, V Brands writer, will be reading. And on that night, you will find out who it was who has designated her China girl. You will not know until until uh, August, uh, April 25th, but then you will find what very famous American person has designated her China girl. So don't miss that. Okay, Jill, if you would do the honors introducing Pam Houston. Thank you. When I introduce students to Pam Houston's writing, these days I usually begin with her Facebook and Twitter photos. Onto the screen, I project a snowscape of her ranch in Colorado at sunrise after a storm, the sand along the shore in Thassos, the blue mosque in Istanbul, her wolfhounds on the couch in yoga-like poses. The sky and sunset in Florida, the air between Seattle and Sitka as seen from a plane window. Scrolling through the images, I feel as if I'm showing them Pam Houston's writing. As she once explained in an interview, photography and writing seem similar to me in terms of framing, the way everything depends on what you leave in and what you leave out. I often construct stories as if they are a series of photographs, a series of sharp and particular images, a physical landscape that will stand in for the story's emotional landscape that will carry and convey the story's emotional weight. She credits writers such as Richard Bosch, Tim O'Brien, Mark Doty, Nick Flynn, David Shields, and Toni Morrison for giving her the artistic permission to embrace the territory, that glimmering landscape between fiction and nonfiction. I discovered Pam Houston in Boulder, Colorado, when I passed the front window of a bookstore and saw the cover of Cowboys Are My Weakness. I stepped inside the store shook my coat from the snow, and walked up the stairs to the second floor literature room. I stood in the quiet of the ballroom-like space, reading the collection with the intriguing cowboy hat on its cover. And by the time I got to one line in the first story about a Chris Christopherson song, and another one alluding to a Glenn Campbell song about staying gentle on my mind, I couldn't stop. I bought the book and quickly stepped over to the attached coffee shop where the turned down sound of a Counting Crow song played. I ordered a vanilla latte and kept reading. A few hours later, I finished the last story at a back corner table by the community bulletin board, the one with all the flyers for yoga classes, drum circles, and guitarists looking for a band. Then I put on my coat and walked back out into the snow, wondering about the stories I tell 
that put walls around my own life. What I've told you isn't true, partly. <laughs> I've spent a lot of time in that magnificent bookstore on Pearl Street, in that cafe sipping lattes, and I wanted to take you there. But to be honest, I cannot remember the first time I read Pam Houston's Cowboys Are My Weakness. <laughs> Only the first time I saw it on a shelf in a bookstore in Texas. <laughs> I saw the title, the quilted bed, the cowboy hat resting on the headboard post, and I thought, oh no, you don't. <laughs> For weeks, I'd walk by that book, which the store was featuring, trying to ignore it. I knew it was something I needed to read, but I was too young and free and full of my freedom and not yet ready for it. I worried that the book was a mirror. The title of Houston's most recent work, Contents May Have Shifted, reads on one level as a clever play on the concept of air travel. Yet it also conveys on an artistic level the ways in which we write our lives by shifting time, shifting place, shifting our very selves. If I were writing a story about discovering Pam Houston's writing, it would happen in Colorado. I'd be alone and there'd be snow. I've now read and taught Cowboys Are My Weakness so many times that all the readings wrap up so tightly and across each other that the first reading is lost. But what I feel like I remember when I read is every woman I've ever been and how every version of myself can understand the women in Houston's stories. How we invent ourselves through our stories and in a similar way, how the stories we tell put walls around our lives. I've put up a lot of walls in my life. I need more windows. Pam Houston is also the author of Waltzing the Cat, a collection of linked stories, a novel, Sighthound, and a collection of essays called A Little More About Me. Her stories have been selected for volumes of Best American Short Stories, the O. Henry Award, the Pushcart Prize, Best American Short Stories of the Century. She lives part-time on a ranch in Creed, Colorado, near the Witter headwaters of the Rio Grande, she is the director of the creative writing program at UC Davis, teaches in the Pacific University Low Residency MFA program, and at writers' conferences around the country and the world. And she is also a licensed river guide. And contents may have shifted, she writes. I stand at the window and watch, impersonating a woman standing at a window and watching. This is Pam Houston's writing, and that's how I feel when I read it, as if I'm looking not at a mirror, but through a window. It is my honor to introduce you to Pam Houston. Well, thank you, Jill. That was really lovely, and um, I mean really lovely, and it was not lost on me the careful reading of my work. Um, I, I was talking at dinner about getting to interview Toni Morrison and feeling really fluent in her work um, because I read all eight books in a really short time. And, and so I, I, I appreciate being read that way. Um, anyway, it's lovely to be here. Um, I've come a long way. I, I really, in a sense, came all the way from Fairbanks, Alaska, um, where I was just Monday afternoon. Um, and this is only Wednesday. So, uh, so I, I, I have traveled far to be here and um, in various sized aircrafts. Um, and and it's, it's very nice to be here. It, I'm not eager to leave tomorrow, but I'm supposed to be in Boston at 4 o'clock, so we'll see how that works out. Um, <clears throat> I'm... Uh, I'm going to be reading from Contents May Have Shifted. <clears throat> I will tell you a little bit about how it was born um, and made first. 
I was invited to the Wisconsin Book Festival in 19, or 19, in 2006. Um, and I was asked to be part of an evening called Unveiled, where four writers were asked to read work that was completely untested and untried. And I was on tour at the time for the book before this book, which was called Sighthound, and I didn't have any time to write. And so as a result, um, my work was so untried and untested that I had not yet written it when I boarded the plane to Wisconsin. <laughs> and um, in my panic uh, about that fact, um, I, I'm sort of a deadline, last minute person anyway, but but I knew I wouldn't be able to really write a story, you know, like a traditional story in about in the 48 hours I had. But I thought, well, what if I just collect what I think of as these glimmers, these moments, things of interest that have happened to me in the last couple of years or months or just stuff that's sitting there in my brain waiting to be downloaded onto paper. You know, what if I just wrote these little moments and let them stand and read them sort of just next to each other, kind of like a series of prose poems. I, I, I believed that they would talk to each other in a certain way because I had thought of them all at one time. <clears throat> and um, so I wrote them. I wrote some of them on the plane. I wrote some of them when I got to Madison. I wrote all night. Um, and by the next day, I had 12 of them. I tend to do things in 12s. I think of, <clears throat> I think of the world in 12s for some reason. The only caveat is that you have to mention the state of Wisconsin. And I had not. I had these 12 glimmers, and one of them was from Juneau, Alaska, where I had been recently, and one of them was from Davis, where I teach, and one of them was from Colorado, where I live, and one of them was from Gulfport, Mississippi, and none of them were from Wisconsin. So I put goosenecks of the San Juan River aside and I went downstairs and sat on the corner in Madison, Wisconsin and waited for something to happen. <laughs> and uh, after about a half an hour, it did. So I went upstairs and I wrote number 11, Madison, Wisconsin. And then I read the 12 glimmers that evening. And by that time, I had gotten them into an order that made them have a little narrative arc among them, uh, within them. And, um, and Richard Bausch, a, a writer that I admire a lot, uh, came up to me at the reading and he said, those are great, write a hundred of them and it's your next book. Which I hadn't, be I hadn't had five seconds to think that far. I was just trying not to embarrass myself in Wisconsin. <laughs> and um, and so my first thought was, well, no, not 100, 144. And, <laughs> and in the way one writer gives permission to another writer, that I was off and running. And I really never thought twice. I just said, well, Richard Bausch told me I should. So, um, And so then the next six years were taken up with writing 144 of these mini chapters and revising them, of course, and um, finding, I would say letting them find their own order, which both seemed random, but was in fact anything but, and was making a larger narrative arc um, about this woman's life, who is um, coincidentally named Pam in this novel. Um, so I'm going to read you some of these glimmers, and, um, and then I'd be happy to answer some questions. Okay, uh, 132 of them take place someplace and they are named with that place, like Juneau, Alaska, or uh, Davis, California, but there are 12, every 12th glimmer, takes place, no place, in other words, it takes place on an airplane. So this is one of the airplane stories and they are named with the flight number. So this is Delta 55. The plane is gradually but perceptibly descending. 
It is barely light outside and we aren't due at Orly until nearly noon. There is an odd ticking noise coming from the wing outside my window. I come fully awake and realize we are listing strenuously to the right. I glance at my seatmate on the aisle. Her name is Rebecca. She is a 26-year-old bank teller from Cincinnati who has never flown before, who has saved for five years to take her dream trip to Paris. I spent most of dinner telling her how much safer airplanes are than car travel, how the 777 has a minimum of three fail-safes on each of its major systems, how even if one of the engines fell clean off the fuselage, it is designed to tumble backwards, up and over the wing, so it doesn't tear the wing from the plane. Now, in spite of all my reassurances, we seem to be heading shoulder first into the North Atlantic. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the pilot says, as many of you are probably aware, we are descending, preparing to make an unscheduled landing into Reykjavik, Iceland. Approximately 35 minutes ago, we experienced an explosion in our number two engine, and that engine is now inoperable. The ticking sound you hear is the wind running through it, spinning the blades backwards, much like a household fan. You can probably also tell that we are tacking toward Iceland as we would in a sailboat, as our current engine configuration will not give us full power in a straight line. Now Rebecca is awake and looking at me wild-eyed. The man likes a metaphor, I say, and offer a small smile. The light out the window has strengthened and I can see white caps on an angry gray sea. I always kind of wanted to go to Iceland, I say, but by now Rebecca is no longer looking at me. She has her eyes closed tightly, has given herself, I imagine, to prayer. We will be landing in approximately 15 minutes, the captain says. Please give, your undivided flight atten please give your undivided attention to the flight attendants as they instruct you in landing in the brace position. I like that he did not say crash. I like that he is a language guy. <laughs> the ocean is getting quite a bit closer. No sign of Iceland out my window, and I hope that Reykjavik Airport does not turn out to be a metaphor for fucked. <laughs> Just when it seems that our wheels have to be skimming the water, land and runway lights appear, and then more of them. So many lights it is hard to count them. A sea of spinning red and blue, every ambulance and fire truck in Iceland seems to have come out to greet us. <laughs> Holy shit, I say, just before the wheels hit the foam and the foam splashes up and covers all the windows throwing the cabin in a half light exactly like waking up in a tent after a snowstorm and then everyone is cheering as the plane glides to a jerky, sticky stop. Much later, in an upstairs blank space of terminal, as we are being fed rice with some kind of yellow chickeny goo all over it by something resembling the Icelandic Red Cross, <laughs> the crew tells us the reason for the emergency equipment. When the number two engine exploded, it spit jet fuel all over the fuselage. We were a Molotov cocktail hurtling through space, is the way the literary pilot puts it. <laughs> there was no way to be certain that the friction of the tires on the runway wouldn't make a spark and ignite us, turn us into a 90 mile per hour ball of flame. This is Juneau, Alaska. They said we wouldn't see any orcas. They said the humpbacks were in, and when the humpbacks were in, you didn't see the orcas because the orcas are predators and the humpbacks are prey. It's been a long day. We've been all the way up Tracy Arm to the glaciers, and everyone but the captain and I are sleeping when word comes over the radio, orcas in Shearwater Cove. By the time we get there, there's nothing stirring a couple of lazy humpbacks out in the main channel, a sure sign that the orcas are gone. The captain is worried about the hour, worried about the fuel he's got left, worried about his daughter, who's got magenta hair and a t-shirt that says, this is what a feminist looks like, <laughs> who is back from somewhere like Reed College working on his boat this summer, 
selling sodas to the tourists through a permanent scowl. <laughs> There's a fin flash on the far side of the channel, distant but unmistakable, orca, male. The captain says, that's four miles across this channel, minimum. I show him the silver charm around my neck, remind him that it's my last day in Alaska, promise to swim for shore if we run out of gas. Don't lose that fin, he says, turning the bow into the sunset, but I couldn't lose it if I tried. <clears throat> the water of Stephen's passage backlit, a million diamonds rushing toward me in the sun and one black fin, impossibly tall, absurdly geometric, the accompanying blast of whale breath above it, superimposed onto the patterns of light. Spotting whales at sea is not so different from spotting deer in the woods. For hours you see nothing, and then you see one, and suddenly you realize you are surrounded. This pod has 25, by my best counting, the one male who keeps his distance and 24 females, all of them running steadily west. We get out in front and the captain shuts down the engines. Every time the big male spin turns itself up and over and back down under the surface of the water, I can't help myself, I gasp. We are directly in the path of one of the females. Every time she surfaces, we can hear her breathing. Every time she surfaces, I can see the spot of white at her heart. 20 years ago, on my first trip to Alaska, I bought a string of white heart trade beads, and for this trip, I tore the house apart to find them. In three more dives, she'll be under the boat. I touch the beads at my neck and try to guess which side of the boat will get me the closest. The others are stirring, crowding the port side, watching her approach. I choose starboard. She dives one last time and I start counting. At five, she rises right under my hand. The breath from her blowhole is cold on my face. If I dared, I could reach down and touch her on her white spot. Someone behind me screams, maybe the captain's daughter, but the whale is already diving, already resurfacing, a few yards farther on. I listen to the sweep of her fin, the puff of her breathing until she disappears into the disappearing diamonds. When the male's big fin is the only thing visible, a speck on the horizon, we turn the boat north and head for home. This is Banzang Hai Laos. My guide Zai and I are standing in the warm mist of a Mekong River morning in the village of Banzang Hai Laos, watching an unusually tall Laotian tend his boiling vats of Lao Lao, the rice wine moonshine that has put his village on the map. Monkeys scream in the trees above us and a gentle-faced woman stands nearby, holding a glass I fear is meant for me. It is slightly after 8 a.m., and in America, that would be a good enough reason to decline politely. But here in Laos, where decorum is far more rigorous and complicated than it is in America, I'm pretty sure there isn't going to be a way out of drinking the pickled Mekong water that is about to come from the steaming, rusted 50-gallon drum. I reassure myself that no self-respecting amoeba could possibly live in 80-proof hooch <laughs> and quickly down the glass of white I am offered, which gets me another glass, and then a glass of red, which I realize the second it goes down my throat without searing my tonsils isn't nearly as strong as the white. I am seized with regret, flooded by premonitions of feverish vomiting in a Laotian healthcare facility. I do what any sophisticated world traveler would do and stuff an entire antibacterial wipe into my mouth. <laughs> and during the tour of the brightly painted temple, suck every drop of juice out of it I can <laughs> and swallow. Outside the temple, a beautiful woman is making ferns and bougainvillea and daisy petals out of colored paper. I buy a small bouquet from her and ask if I can take her picture. She says something to Zai and he translates. She says she should take your picture because you are the beautiful one 
and I can tell by the tone in his voice that he thinks she is mistaken. <laughs> Zai is the most formal guide I have ever had in Asia, which is saying a great deal. He had been a monk for three months at 18, then he became one again for one day last year when his mother died, so he could carry her body, he says, to the other side. His English is impeccable, except that he says electric city when he means electricity, and comfort table when he means comfortable, and anyone can see why he would think that was correct. At least twice a day, he says, if I am not speaking right, you will please graduate me, but I rarely do. I'm pretty sure I have managed to eat the antibacterial wipe clandestinely until we are back on the boat heading downriver to the magical city of Luang Prabang and Zai says, have I told you yet how the Buddha died? When I say no, he says, he was invited to the house of a friend for dinner and they were serving pak. Pak, I say. Pak, pak, he says, mildly impatient with me as usual and he makes an oinking noise in his throat. Ah, I say, and Zai smile. He knew the pock was bad, Zai says, knew even that it would kill him, but he ate it anyway because it was most important not to offend his hosts. I guess that's the difference, I almost say, between Buddha and me. But on the off chance that Zai has paid me a compliment, I smile out at the muddy river and nod. <clears throat> this is Mount Shasta, California. Carmen gives me valor in a bottle. She says her mother has a special word for men like Ethan, and I think it's going to be something magical and Latin, but the word turns out to be freeloader. <laughs> and even though we have only just met, we drive up as far as the snow will allow us and shout what we want in a man at the mountain. My list has stuff like one, loves many things, and three, <clears throat> wants to have fun, and seven, generous with time, money, spirit, and Carmen starts with one, compassion, and ends with ten, self-love that is not self-absorption. <clears throat> Absorption. I'm just going to cough. <clears throat> All right, hopefully we got rid of that. While we are at it, we shout things we want besides a man. And I say, a teaching job in Colorado, less back pain, and a trip to Antarctica. And she says, a walk-in closet, a half-ton pickup, and a babysitter I can trust. <laughs> Later, at a bar full of guys in Carhartts with Saturate before using on the stereo, we meet up with two women who have both just returned from Burning Man. Ava, who wants to be beautiful and to stop eating fruit, calls Burning Man the four worst days of her life. It made her heart hurt, she says, all those people looking to fill a bottomless need. Sasha says it was the four most important days of her life, though both Carmen and I find her descriptions of the festival far more terrifying than Ava's. Then we go home and watch the Dixie Chicks movie twice, all the way through without stopping. <laughs> I check my voicemail and Cinder has left a little song on it that goes, how do you solve a problem like Fatima? Fatima is one of Ethan's other girlfriends. And Nora has left a message that says, I think Ethan missed out on a few of the simple things like mercy. And practical Karen has left one that says, swear to God, <clears throat> if he isn't out of there by the end of spring break, I'm driving up and we're going to the Target and getting a whole bunch of those big blue plastic containers and all his shit's going out on the curb. And I know they're all trying to help me, but seriously, after four solid hours of shut up and sing, Ethan couldn't re-engage my attention if he brought Harrison Ford home for a threesome. <laughs> At Crystal Lake the next morning, under the shadow of that giant white she mountain, it is just a little too easy to tell Ava why she ought to stop dating the alcoholic. On the peak, the wind is blowing up frozen clouds in the shape of Armageddon, though it is still as a church where we are standing and warm. I say, I don't know, I'm just feeling so 
Say it, Carmen says. Say it. Powerful. I had been trying to decide between directionless and untethered. <laughs> Powerful, I say, just as the wind reaches the surface of the lake. This is uh, Tucson, Arizona. I think maybe I'll have a drink of that water. That might help me. <clears throat> I don't let my students drink water at the reading. I say, cowboy up. <laughs> I never drink water during a reading. Anyway, like nobody wants to watch you drink water, I say. Um, all right, this is Tucson, Arizona. I have not been on the property 30 minutes when I am lying on a massage table in a softly lit Frangipani scented room with a person named Trevor towering over me. I can see, Trevor says, that you are doing a lot of spiritual work because look how far you are out in your hair. His accent is vaguely South African and he has the most impressive unibrow I have ever seen. <laughs> I do not read poetry, Trevor says, because I live poetry. <laughs> He picks my feet up and lets them fall back to the table. May I ask you, he says, why the lower half of your body is perpetually standing in ice cold water? He means energetically, of course, because the room is warm and my legs are dry. And what happened here, he asks, not waiting for an answer. <clears throat> he has his hand on my leg at the exact place where, when I was four years old, my father threw me so hard against a big oak wardrobe that I broke my femur. The bone healed 40 years ago. I was casted from the tip of my toes to my armpits for months. But Trevor is not the first healer to be able to see what happened. My father, I begin. I am not afraid of your pain, Trevor says. I am not afraid of your grief. I am not afraid of your terror. You want to know why I'm not afraid of your terror? I nod. I am not afraid of your terror because I have gone inside the monster and inside the monster is pure wonder. Somewhere in this building, my friend Willow, who I have come to Canyon Ranch with, is getting a nice, simple lavender scrub <laughs> and an herbal wrap. <laughs> Willow looked through the catalog, thought, yes, the first night, maybe a nice herbal wrap after all that travel. Pamela, Trevor says, Will you tell me your father's name so that I may ask him to excuse himself from the lower half of your body? <laughs> yes, I say, and I do. Sebastian, Trevor says, Sebastian, you must get out of there. Sebastian, he says, it does not belong to you. He has his eyes closed and his hands tight around my ankles. No, Sebastian, he says more forcefully now, there are no options. <laughs> we stay like that for an excruciating amount of time. Then he folds my hands across my chest and covers them with his. If you could have only one thing, he says, would you choose peace or ecstasy? Ecstasy, I think, though I'm pretty sure I'm supposed to say peace. <laughs> <coughs> peace is an illusion, Trevor says. I am in the ecstasy nearly all the time now, even when I sleep. I think of the composer's lonely bedroom, the terrible black sheets, the clock radio projecting blood red digits onto the ceiling, his bald head a glinting Cabernet color like someone already dead. Pamela, Trevor says, slapping the bottom of my feet with his palms. Yes, sir, I say, out of habit. He's got my wrists now, is stretching them back over my head. No one has ever called me Pamela except my father. You have two glasses, Trevor says. One is completely full and one is completely empty. In which glass is stillness possible? The full one, I say. The questions are getting easier. Trevor now has his powerful thumbs wrapped almost completely around my uppermost vertebra. You can get to stillness through ecstasy, he says, but you can't get to ecstasy through stillness. I think about all the ways the language of the New Age is custom made for terrorism. <laughs> I think about when a pink mouth opened in a white sky over Davis, and I saw for the second time the cupped waiting hands. When one of the doing lines in your life intersects with the circle of your now, Trevor says, what 
It bends and bends and eventually becomes a circle. Precisely, he says, and releases his death grip on my neck. <clears throat> this is Drigung, Tibet. Shring and Haley and I follow an old llama to the top of a bald hill above the monastery in the cool morning air. We have been told there will be three corpses, a man, a woman, and a child, and that they are unrelated, though they appear to us like a little family, laid out on the platform, wrapped in their cotton shrouds. We are very lucky, Shring says, many corpses today. <clears throat> when he says corpse, it sounds like cops, as in pines. <clears throat> The man who will prepare the bodies arrives and begins to unwrap the first corpse. A little ways up the hill, roughly a hundred vultures jockey for position against a rope held in place by family members of the deceased. They are wild birds, but Drigung is the most accessible monastery practicing sky burials. The birds know to come at 11 a.m. for their almost daily feed. Shring told us the bodies would be quartered but the word filleted is the one that jumps to mind. He explains that the man with the big knife will make four incisions, one around the chin, one down the center of the torso, and two at a diagonal down the shoulder blades. They pull the skin off the bones, he says, because if they don't give the vultures the bones first, they sometimes eat the flesh and leave the bones, and then the whole person doesn't ascend together, and there is more work for the butchers to pound the bones into pulp. He hesitates enough over the word butcher that I know he is not quite happy with it, <clears throat> but he doesn't know a better one. These men, he says, that do the cutting, they are not allowed to marry. Their karma is very bad. Same with the men who butcher animals. Do you mean this job is punishment for their last life, I ask him, or that they will be punished for this job in the next life? Yes, he says. Also <laughs> jewelers, it is the same. Jewelers, I say, why? It is just what we believe, he tells me. Is it because they are wealthy? I ask again. It is just what we believe, he says. All three bodies are cut into pieces, and I miss whatever sign the llama gives to the men who have been holding the rope. When the vultures run in, the smell takes up all the air on the mountaintop, and as they rush past me, I can see that they are huge birds, each of them half the size of a man. There is squawking and shrieking. Several birds go after one femur. Another makes off with a forearm, the hand with all the flesh still on it, <coughs> bouncing along the stones at my feet. No fewer than six birds are pulling in different directions on a skull that is still attached to a spine that is still attached to one leg, and the skull is laughing. The old llama plays tug of war with a vulture over a leg bone, and when he wins, he lifts another vulture, this one nearly featherless, out of the melee and gives him what is left of the bone. That is a sick one, Shrank says. Every so often, the butcher picks up <coughs> an especially aggressive vulture by its head and hauls it off to the side. When there is nothing left but skulls and pelvises, the butcher steps back in and pounds the big bones into pulp with a giant mallet. Bone pulp flies all over the place, and a huge wad of it lands on Shring's arm. In seconds, a member of the family of the deceased comes over with a little bottle of alcohol and wipes it clean for him. His preparedness makes me realize this must happen all the time. Shring smiles at the man out from under his Scooby-Doo hat. On the walk back down the hill, Shring says, when I see a sky burial, all desire to have money and get more things goes away. Because you see a man, then you see him dead in a ball, then you see him cut to pieces, and in 20 minutes he is nothing. It is like he never existed. Shring picks sage so that we can burn it in the little stupa back at the monastery. When we get there, he shows me how to stick my whole upper body in so that I won't take the, be the bad dead people luck with me back into the world. When I can't see or breathe anymore, I pull my head out, but Denzing grabs me by the scruff of the neck and pushes me back in. It is very unusual, Shring says, when Denzing finally turns me loose, a Westerner here at this ceremony, 
Denzing is afraid that now the car will crash. Denzing holds Haley in the stupa so long, I think she will surely asphyxiate. <clears throat> when he finally lets her out, he talks with urgency for several minutes to Shring in Tibetan. And when he's finished, we ask what he said. Shring thinks a long time, then says, Denzing says it is good to be happy all of the time. <clears throat> really? Haley says, all those words? And, Shring says, after a pause, he says it is sometimes also good to be sad. <clears throat> this is 71. Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Driving from Chicago in the minus six degree weather, neck craned out the window looking for the lunar eclipse because the rocket scientists told me to, but the light pollution extends all the way to the Wisconsin border and I think I'm probably facing the wrong direction anyhow. If I became the rocket scientist's girlfriend, the fortune cookie about me being the reasonable one would never, ever, ever be true. In Milwaukee, everything is frozen solid. The river, the stoplights, even my car door. But when I get to my high-rise hotel room, there is the eclipse right out my window, halfway over and looking strange enough to scare a caveman or an ancient Egyptian to death. Trish comes to meet me for breakfast with her sperm bank in vitro baby, and I have no idea how to respond as she details all the ways her life has become a living hell. <laughs> She knows I thought she was crazy to do it at her age, alone with her 80 hour a week job, and now here she is as if to prove me wrong, but everything she says makes her life sound about 10 times worse than I could even imagine. <laughs> the lake is frozen out as far as you can see, blocks of ice heaved up on the shore like wrecked cars, and Cliff Parker, whose law firm is sponsoring my visit, picks me up and takes me to the Milwaukee Country Club for lunch. It is so much like the country club in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania that my father could just barely afford to belong to, it takes my breath away. Only it is like it is still 1972 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The white wallpaper with little parasol toting maidens doing tour jetés across it. The four dead gray-haired ladies propped up in the corner as if to look like they're playing bridge. The place probably seats 250, not even counting the no women allowed grill downstairs. And yet, other than the dead ladies in the corner, we are the only ones eating today. <clears throat> the point of this luncheon, I quickly understand, is so that Cliff can show me why he is a lawyer and not a writer. <laughs> to show me the kind of life he gave up writing for. He has invited eight people to the luncheon besides the two of us, and exactly none of them show up. I can't decide if Cliff Parker is a sociopath or just so completely normal that he is incomprehensible to me. <laughs> Our waitress is actually named Trudy. She has a beehive hairdo and is at least 114 years old. We both order the Cobb salad, and for some inexplicable reason, it takes 45 minutes to arrive. The room is being heated to a sultry 85 degrees, and there is a squirrel hurling himself repeatedly at the floor to ceiling window behind Cliff's head. <laughs> over and over, he climbs the nearest tree and then flies, flying squirrel style, and lands splat with his face against the window, where his paws achieve suction for a little more than one second before he slides like a cartoon character down to the bottom of the glass. He does this five or six times before I comment on it, Though it makes such a terrible noise every time he hits, I can't believe Cliff doesn't turn around. <clears throat> Probably rabid, Cliff says, <laughs> with a casual wave of his hand, and I feel my eyebrows go up, and he says, a lot of the squirrels around here are. <clears throat> this is 80, Portland, Oregon. Rick says, Pam, if everyone deserved a down pillow, there wouldn't be any more birds. <laughs> this is 111. <laughs> Trenton, New Jersey. <clears throat> Trenton, as we say. Let's say, for the sake of argument, that my back hurts so much because 
When I was four and in my three-quarter body cast, my mother found it easiest to carry me around upside down like a monkey, <laughs> using the plaster bar the doctors had fashioned between my knees to keep them for three and a half months the correct distance apart. And let's say she did just that until my second to last appointment with the orthopedic surgeon. And he said, you haven't been carrying her around by this bar, have you? <laughs> and my mother shot one quick glance at my father and said, of course not, no. And it became a funny story the two of them liked to tell together to friends over a couple of drinks. And let's say that when their friends asked, as of course they would, how in the name of heaven a four-year-old breaks her femur, they said that I had somehow managed to pull the giant wardrobe over onto myself, except instead of wardrobe, they would have said credenza, because it would have made us sound richer than we were. I still don't see how it would make me feel any better to think of the pain in my hip and spine as anything other than my most loyal and valuable companion. The continuous non-voice in my ear that says, you got out alive and you still get to go. No two people who have ever lived love to travel more than my mother and father. They gave that love in their fashion to me. And I will conclude with Istanbul, Turkey, <clears throat> a place I love a lot. At the Sultan's Palace, beautiful long-limbed girl, sexy but not too sexy, lots of brassy hair, surrounded by seven or eight international travelers her age. To an Australian boy with acne scars, she says, you are walking through the Topkapi Palace with three beautiful women. What more do you want? <laughs> the other young women are not in the same room of beautiful as she, but they accept the compliment. Don't dare to interrupt. The boy says, maybe if you were all naked, and laughs. One of the other girls, a Swede, says, no, meaning, go fuck yourself, acne face. <laughs> The brassy-haired girl holds her fingers to the Swede's lips, says, my parents taught me never to say no immediately. To men, the Swede asks, to anything, she says. Istanbul is the only major city in the world that is situated on two continents. Since 330 AD, it has been the capital of the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, the Latin Empire, and as recently as 1922, the Ottoman Empire. In the hilly streets, ruin leans into palace, leans into internet cafe. We are in line waiting to get into the harem. Miles of tiled, low-lit corridors and rooms so thick with ghosts of women in captivity, you can feel their hair on your arm, their jasmine-scented breath on your face. In the Blue Mosque, there are 250,000 tiles the color of sky. When the sun comes out, inside is sky and outside is golden. I am 46 years old and ashamed of the fact that this is the first mosque of my life. But later, when the evening call to prayer catches me in the garden between the Blue Mosque and the Hagia Sophia, call and echo, echo and answer, bouncing off domes and turrets that have stood on this hill for 1,500 years, I know faith springs out of doubt like topsoil, and one thing I am is here right now. Across the Golden Horn, where the Bosphorus meets the Sea of Marmara, the Asian part of the city glistens in the twilight. As a candidate for the center of everything, Istanbul beats Pueblo, Colorado, hands down. <laughs> the gulls are turning cartwheels around the towers of the Blue Mosque and cawing like crazy women. Byzantium, I say to them, Constantinople. The circle of my now is wreaking havoc with the lines of my doing. I am learning to say yes, if not always immediately. A sweet-faced Turkish boy, maybe 19, offers me a Kleenex, puts both hands over his heart when I take it, says I look just like his mother when I cry. Thank you. I'd be happy.
happy to answer a question or two if there is one. Yes. Um, I, I, I'm very comfortable. <laughs> that is my number. I'm, um, I, the, what she's referring to, for those who don't know, when my very first book, Cowboys and My Weakness, came out a long, long time ago, um, people would say, how much of this is you? And I would say, a lot. A lot of it's me. And they would say, but how much? And I would say, well, a lot. You know, And that didn't satisfy them. <laughs> And people seem to want a number. So I said 82, 82%, which seemed about right. That seemed like the number. Sometimes I say 86. I don't know why exactly, but it's somewhere in the 80s for sure. And, um, and then I wrote uh, another book of stories. And then a book of essays came out called A Little More About Me. And people like to introduce me by saying, well, we've had... 82%, but now we get 100%. And, you know, I would go to the microphone and say, no, you know, still coming in about 82. Because, <laughs> because for me, that's what writing has always been. We talked about this a little bit in class today, but, you know, when I was in graduate school, there wasn't creative nonfiction. It, it just didn't exist. I mean, there were a few books out there that people knew about. There was In Cold Blood, and there was In Patagonia, which was one of my favorites. But... It wasn't anything like it is now, and you only wrote a memoir if you were Zsa Zsa Gabor or something, um, or you know Madonna, <laughs> to, to bring it slightly closer to your generation. Um, I'm not quite old enough to have said Zsa Zsa Gabor, but but anyway. Um, so so this is all very new. So when I was in school, my my choices were fiction and poetry, and I knew I wasn't a poet, though I admire poetry greatly, and. So I thought the whole ball game was that you took your lived experience, you paid really close attention in the world, you brought it to the page and you shaped it into a story. And that's what I've always been doing. And um, for instance, with this book, I really didn't know right up till the end whether we, and when I say we, I mean not only me and my editor, but also the publicity department and the legal department. We're gonna call it a memoir or a novel. And we called it a novel. And that was fine with me because, I, because contents may have shifted mm -hmm. slightly. And I didn't want to go out on tour and have somebody say, there are 372,000 tiles the color of sky. Like, I, did, I didn't want to have those conversations, though I, I did look up how many tiles there were. You know what I mean? Like, I, I didn't want the conversation to be about that. I would much rather have the conversation about why I would call such autobiographical work a novel. I think that's a more interesting conversation. Um, one reason, and then we were going to not call it anything. <laughs> this, this book owes a lot of itself in a certain way to... Tim O'Brien's very famous book, The Things They Carried, which was an important book to me when I was learning how to be a writer. And that book doesn't say anything on it. The, 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 the narrator's name is Tim, but it is shelved in fiction. But it does not say novel anywhere on it, nor does it say short stories, which it also is. <laughs> um, it's a collection of short stories that make a novel that is hugely autobiographical. That's what, that's sort of what the things they carried is. So anyway, this book is like that. And, um, and so I wasn't going to say anything. And this, it's so interesting the way decisions get made. I think you'll find this interesting. So we were looking for a cover and they sent me, this is the cover and it's got this, I don't know how well you can see it, but it's got this, you know, contents may have shifted is the title and it's got this steps up to the airplane, but no airplane, right? So I, and, and it didn't have this little cloud up here. So I looked at it and I said, that's good. I, I like that, that whoever thought of this got the book. But I also thought it's a little cold. It's a little ironic for me. Like this book is about other things besides irony and besides loss. It's really about faith and, and, and hopefulness, like hopefulness in the face of constant screwing up. And it's about things that aren't quite as cold as this. And... Um, so they agreed with me, 
I'm not in charge. I, I don't mean to make it sound like I'm like my word goes, but that is what I said. I said I really like it. It's really smart. It's a little cold. And they said, yeah, we agree with you. So then there was some. They tried to do a lot of things. They put a prayer flag on the down here on the on the thing, and that didn't really work. And, but anyway, then they sent me this with the heart cloud. Well, as much as I didn't want it to be cold, I wanted it to be sentimental less. And so I was like, a heart cloud is sentimental, and I don't want a cloud in the shape of a heart on my book. Even though, in combination, it kind of got at it in a certain way. So then we decided if the heart cloud had a job, it would be less sentimental. And its job is to carry the word a novel. And that's how this book became a novel, basically. I mean, I mean, I mean, that's not how it became a novel as opposed to a memoir. Uh, that was really about legal. That was really about the legal department. But that's how it got the word novel on the cover. Because you could also argue that it's a collection. I mean, you could, you could, you could, you could make an argument for this book being almost anything. And that's sort of true about all my books. Um, but especially true about this book. So. So I feel fine about it. Um, I like having this conversation, which I've now had about 150 times, you know, more or less, <laughs> as I've traveled around the country. I, I've had so many funny versions of it. Like, when the book first came out, my very first reading was at Book Passage in near San Francisco, and it was a big audience, and everyone was really excited. And this one woman, she's like, she's like, why is this a novel? And I was, you know, I told her, you know, my whatever. And she said, <laughs> and she said, um, she said, but I wanted it to be you. And I was like, well, it is. You know, and she's like, no, I wanted it to really be you. And I was like, but you don't even know me. Like, I don't know you. Like, why is that? You know, she's really cooler than me. And she is, you know, because she says all the things I wish I'd said. You know, so anyway, and then the very next night in Sa that was in Marin, and then the very next night in San Francisco, this guy comes up to me after the reading, and he's like, "If you made anything up, you have to call it a novel." And I said, "Well, it says right there." I showed him the hard cloud. I said, it, "It's a novel," and he goes, "No, if you made anything up, it has to be a novel." I was like, what conversation are we having? I don't, know what, I don't know what conversation we're having. Like, this is a subject that makes people freak out. You know, it really makes people crazy. And I didn't really get that. I mean, I should have gotten it from the whole Oprah Jim Fry thing. But, I, but, but as it's applied to me, like, it, it really makes people crazy. And that's where you want to live as an artist, you know? And I don't, you know, people... Like one way I answer the question, why did you call this a novel, which is not the question you asked me, but, but one reason I, one way I answer it is I say, because right now there's a law against writing a memoir where you have altered anything for artistic purposes, and there is no law against writing a novel where everything really happened. And in a sense, that's the simplest answer. That's why. Um, you know, and yeah, and I and I, I wrote an essay for for Jill for for Professor Talbot um, <laughs> about about this. You know, about like about the reasons in my own life and my own childhood and my own experience where I just don't believe that language can, you know, represent reality exactly. This, it sounds so obvious when I say it. I, I kind of you know I'm just saying something idiotic, but. I don't believe that it can. And I just don't, because, because language is, because meaning is happening at this ever-changing junction of code and context. It won't sit still, which is why we're in love with it, which is why it's so appealing to be a writer, because you're always reaching after that meaning that you can never quite have. Now, does that mean if you're writing the New York Times you shouldn't try? No, you know, no. There are reasons why in certain kinds of writing we should strive toward getting it as accurate as language can, but even that is only so accurate. Also, you know, things in my childhood didn't happen logically. Things did not logically follow other things. So, you know, it, that, 
that sort of shatteredness of the narrative and the, well, how did it really happen? I don't know. I was telling, I was telling Jill today and I didn't even realize that, you know, it was like our, the first conversation we had. She's like, well, how old was your mother when she died? I was like, we have no idea because she lied about her age and we let her lie about her age. And my father lied about her age in the obituary. Well, that's just a tiny thing, but it's like, it's the kind of accuracy that people ask for in memoirs. Like you can't say your mother died at 76 if she died at 71 or the Oprah police are gonna get you. Well, <laughs> well it, but however, it's much more interesting to say, well, I don't know how old my mother was even though she was my mother. And Jill said, well, couldn't you look it up somewhere? And I was like, <laughs> Well, I could, but I wouldn't, because that was the agreement we made in our family. And families make all kinds of agreements to lie. And married people make all kinds of agreements to lie to each other. And, and you know, and people, people lie constantly. And that's interesting, you know? So this idea that we, oh, all I have to do is write it the way it really happened. Like, it's not so simple. Not so simple, I don't believe. So I, I love this topic, actually. You'd think I'd be sick of it now, but I'm not. I think it's much more interesting than someone saying to me, but wait, I was in Istanbul and there were only two mosques. You know, I, like that, I didn't want to have that conversation. Is that good? Is there one more for the road? Okay, excellent. Thank you very much.